So on behalf of Asia Pacific Evolution Association and organizers, I would like to thank and welcome Ms. Sabrina, Regional Evaluation Advisor of UN mm. Women Asia Pacific. Uh, uh, also, uh, would like to invite Ms. Ritu, a core group member of Evolution Community of India, who is participating today as a discussant, and Dr. Sanjay Kumar, also co core group member of Evolution Community of India and a mini specialist for U uh, UNFPA India as a moderator. And thank you and welcome you all the participants who's joining us today. And I believe that we will have a productive discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sugar, for your opening remarks. Uh, welcome uh, all the participants for this very, very important uh, coffee break sessions today, uh, which is on um, uh, evaluations, taking into account gender responsive evaluations, particularly uh, in the situation of COVID-19. Uh, I am, on behalf of ECOI, I am privileged to be part of uh, this session uh, as a moderator. And you have just seen, we have a very eminent uh, two speakers to talk about. Uh, but uh, I would also uh, like to emphasize that uh, we and our speakers will surely talk about uh, uh, what are the risks and uh, what are the, the factors we should consider while undertaking gender responsive evaluation during current situation. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we would also like to listen to all the participants, particularly those who have actually have experience, expertise, and have tested uh, their, this approach during current situation. So, uh, as you know, that um, the situation is very, very uh, different, is an unprecedented situation. And uh, I think you all agree that it has actually change the whole lives of from all the spheres from economic to social and all these things and so does it also has an impact on uh, uh, undertaking research and evaluations and i would also like to uh, put a point here is that uh, when we talk about evaluations so it is not during covid yes it is important but at the same time even after COVID, when we hopefully come back to new normal situation, so that also it will be very pertinent uh, in the way we, we approach evaluations and try to see uh, how the COVID has now currently impacting and maybe after some time we should look back and try to see how it has impacted uh, the lives of the women and men uh, differently or what has been the impact especially on women's on various aspects of lives. So with this uh, opening words, uh, before uh, getting into to my uh, very eminent speaker, uh, Sabrina, uh, I would like to set a few ground rules and uh, request everyone please follow that. And also I'll give you some information about how do we uh, plan to, to go about it. Uh, the grounded rule, the first one is please mute your mics so that uh, there's no disturbance because we have many people joined for, uh, for this session. Uh, then also we will open up uh, with the question and answer session after the, the two speakers uh, put their presentation and you can, uh, as you know, you can raise your hands by clicking the icon there. And uh, just as an icebreaker, uh, you have already started getting into that uh, I started with the first question. So great that we know that at least we have got around few countries uh, from which, from where you, uh, you are listening to or participating in this particular uh, session. So friends, I hope you all have a coffee with you uh, to start the session. And uh, now let me uh, request uh, uh, Sabrina, uh, who is M&A specialist at uh, the regional office of UN Women, that is UN Women Independent Evaluation and Audit Services. And uh, I just uh, would like to invite her and uh, hand over uh, the floor to her to talk about 
a gender responsive evaluation, particularly in COVID situation. So Sabrina, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, colleagues, and it's great to be a part of this session today. Um, we do have a couple of questions on Menti just to, to hear from you, from the participants. Um, as Sanjay and, and Sugar have already mentioned, we really wanted this to be, uh, you know, more of an interactive, informal sort of coffee break where we really discuss these issues and learn from each other. So we're just here as facilitators and we look forward to hearing from you and your experience and understanding what are the opportunities and challenges that um, we're all being faced with. So please take a minute so that we know who's online um, and the experience that you have. We have a, um, as you can see, the questions on menti.com. Do you have experience in conducting a study assessment or evaluation in the situation of COVID-19? Right now we have 13 saying yes and 11 saying no. So that's actually more people do have experience. So we'd really love to hear from you. Um, during this session. So please do speak up, uh, raise your hand, and uh, you can type into the questions uh, question box. So um, last question here is how do you rate your level of expertise in the below area? So to what extent do you consider yourself an expert on integrating gender equality in evaluation or assessments? And the second one is to what extent do you consider yourself an expert in conducting or managing evaluations? Okay, so as you can see, we have a lot of experts in online today with us today. So we do uh, encourage you to speak up and it's great to see um, that you've joined today so we can have a sort of collective learning experience. So um, we will, uh, I do have a short presentation just to sort of frame the discussion. Uh, and so I would request that you do you know, keep your uh, questions and um, interventions until the end um, so that we can um, make sure to have a smooth webinar. Um, I will stop sharing this and um, just pull up my presentation. Okay, I hope you can see my screen now. I also have my cup of coffee, so <laughs> hope you have yours. Um, yeah, so, okay. okay, great. So today I will be discussing um, a UN Women Pocket Tool that we uh, recently developed uh, for managing gender responsive evaluation during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now this is a tool that was primarily designed for um, UN women staff, but it can be equally uh, relevant to um, colleagues in other uh, agencies and other um, and independent evaluators. And it can also be applicable to um, other types of assessments. Just, um, okay, so what is it? It's really um, a sort of, um, a compilation of tips and resources on gender equality and women empowerment considerations for evaluations. Um, it moves through the entire phase of an evaluation. Today, we'll just look at a few of these and we won't go into too much depth, but we hope that we can also um, talk about the reality of implementing this um, in the field. So what is gender responsive evaluation? And how is it different from you know, regular evaluation is a question I often get. Well, gender responsive evaluation is really um, about taking a, a different lens to an evaluation. It's 
it's being explicit that we're taking a human rights based approach and we are looking at how power dynamics are different between um, genders, between communities, between um, at the individual level, at the community level, and at the, at the broader sort of national level. We are looking at how laws and policies create structural barriers for participation, for equal participation of women and um, to have equal uh, rights within society. So it's really taking this lens and applying it to an evaluation. It's analyzing the data from a gender perspective, looking at how women and men, girls and boys are affected differently from, from um, crises, from, from everyday life. And we know that during COVID-19, uh, women uh, are definitely being disproportionately affected. And we'll go into some of the data uh, in the presentation. So some of the principles for gender responsive evaluation at UN Women include fair power relations and empowerment, participation and inclusion, independence and impartiality, and intentionality and use of evaluation. So we're not only talking about what we're analyzing, but we're talking about the process itself that needs to be gender responsive and transparent and um, including uh, different viewpoints. So we see that we all need to analyze our own biases and even inherently as an evaluator, we bring our own values and experiences to um, our work and we need to be explicit and um, make these um, open in, in the context of the evaluation. So first and foremost, during this COVID-19 pandemic, we need to ensure that if we are going to move forward with an evaluation that uh, we do no harm, that the actions of the evaluation team must not put themselves and others at risk. So we, this is the first and foremost um, step or consideration that we need to, to take. So stakeholders and donors um, and other, all, all sort of um, participants of programs need to be informed about um, whether you're going forward with an evaluation or not. In all phases of the evaluation, we need to ensure that people are uh, engaged and we're hearing their voice about the, their concerns, about their questions that they would like to be answered. Um, during the planning phase, uh, we have a few considerations. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we, we do think it's really important to consider whether the evaluation will provide critical information for the organization's COVID-19 response efforts. Right now, we're all, you know, scrambling to respond to the, these, this um, pandemic, which not only is about a health response, but it's about the social and economic uh, effects of this pandemic that will be long, long um, standing and will be around for years to come. And so we need to understand how this evaluation will contribute to those efforts. We also need to consider whether we can reach uh, rights holders through remote data collection methods. Will we be able to really hear the voices of those uh, that are being affected? And of course, if this is an evaluation required by the donor, uh, we should be um, considering with them whether this is uh, this can be postponed. There are different types of approaches you may want to consider within your own organization, whether it's uh, you could do a real-time uh, evaluation or a rapid assessment. You can phase the evaluation activities, prioritizing remote data collection or delaying field data collection, take advantage of existing secondary data, and uh, we'll go into the remote data collection methods. And um, really important too is the final point, point around coordinating with partners. So for us, it's really important that we co coordinate within the UN system. Um, so where there are other evaluations in similar areas, we should, we should really speak to each other and um, make sure that we're not duplicating, that we can leverage each other's um, data and, and experience. So during the preparation stage, um, I will go into just one of these in a bit more detail. 
But uh, we need to be asking these questions around how are we going to ensure the health and safety of the staff, rights holders, and all relevant stakeholders. Uh, we need to understand the, the context of COVID-19 within the country, within the community that we are, are planning on visiting. And we need to engage stakeholders to ensure that the process is responsive to the context, transparent, participatory, and inclusive. Um, defining our objective, scope, and key evaluation questions, ensuring a gender perspective and exploration of the impacts of COVID-19 is really critical, and identifying appropriate methods for gender responsive remote data collection. So here, just to go into a bit more detail, um, one of the steps that is really critical right now is to look at existing information. There is a wealth of information out there and this um, tool also points you towards a lot of that. Um, just as an example, UN Women, um, we have a regional gender data team and they've been uh, conducting rapid assessments, uh, rapid survey across the, the Asian and Pacific region, but it's also being done in, in other regions. And we have emerging, you know, real time sort of data around what sort of the impacts are. And so really leveraging that data is important so that we can understand what are the key issues that we should be looking at. Um, also, just in terms of existing information, what kind of evaluations are, are available, um, we need to sort of minimize the burden that we're placing on stakeholders through, through um, primary data collection because we know that people are, are overworked, overburdened right now, and um, we don't want to be adding to that. Assessing the key barriers to gender equality and advancing women's rights in the current context of COVID-19. And so thus, what type of information should be prioritized? As mentioned, we already have a lot of emerging data available. So it's really about seeking out what kind of information is, uh, is, is there and, um, and what are the gaps. And I think it's really important to consider, you know, this is a program or project within a broader system. So how is that project um, really being um, seen within the broader systems within which it operates? So um, what are the, the sort of, at the individual level, what are the, the different dynamics within the households that may be um, needing to be looked into? What are the dynamics at the communal level? Um, are, is that community, gaining access to services? Are they, um, do they have access barriers to markets, to services, to um, data, to, um, to mobile phones? So then we have uh, prioritize and collect data remotely. Um, as mentioned, we're, we're, we're suggesting to prioritize the issues where there are data gaps and that can be answered through remote data collection um, while recognizing that there will be limitations to the data. So really important um, is that we need to understand the safety risks around remote data collection methods on violence against women and girls in the COVID-19 context. And there's a great uh, brief from you and women on this that goes into detail. And I think also um, Dr. Sanjay will be briefly touching upon this as well. So I won't go into further detail here. Um, considering the most marginalized. So we need to consider the effects of COVID-19 on, on the most marginalized groups and determine how this will be addressed in the evaluation data collection methods and activities. How will we be hearing their voices? How will we understand their concerns? And consulting stakeholders is key. Um, in terms of understanding the data, as I mentioned, UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific have preliminary findings from their rapid assessment surveys in several countries. This is the latest data from the end of April, but I think they are publishing new data um, soon. Um, this is just to highlight you know, some of the key, key issues that we're seeing and how women are being affected differently. So in Bangladesh and Pakistan, fewer women than men are receiving necessary information to prepare for COVID-19. 
in Bangladesh and the Maldives, women in informal employment are more likely than men to see their working hours reduced. In all countries surveyed, women are more likely to see increases in both unpaid domestic and unpaid care work since the spread of COVID-19. And we know that in all crises, um, the risk of violence is much higher. And this is a particularly unique um, situation where we are in lockdown measures and we're uh, forced to be at home, which creates further risks. And actually, uh, UN Women has recently published another study on the increase in um, calls that hotlines are receiving. And in some uh, hotline uh, services are receiving an increase of 80% calls. So these are important considerations uh, for you when you're thinking about what are those different impacts and, and how are we going to then think about how to integrate or, or consider them in, in the design of the evaluation. Some considerations for remote data collection. We need to determine the access to communication technology. Um, we need to take into, you know, we need to ensure that not only do people have access to whatever technology we're suggesting, but they need to have the confidence to use it. We need to take into consideration the factors that may limit participation. Um, such as the internet access and data top-up access. We need to identify times that are convenient given the extra care and work duties. And we need to be cognizant around uh, distractions and diversions during the data collection. And we should also keep the process brief. We should also always have a list of resources provided by um, whichever organization you're working with to refer respondents to in case there is a need identified for COVID-19 or gender-based violence services. Um, even though we're suggesting that no direct question should be asked about participants' um, experience of gender-based violence, we should always have resources available in case it does come up during a discussion. So remote data collection methods, they don't really look quite different from what we are usually doing in an evaluation. But what we're suggesting is that we rely more heavily on secondary data, on that data that already exists. So for example, looking at the hotlines, um, we can go to hotlines and, and, um, and get those, uh, the data and understand better where the woman calling from, can we understand you know, different uh, socioeconomic characteristics of the women that are calling um, so that we can better target programs. Surveys, there are a lot of surveys going on right now, so it's really important to coordinate those efforts with, um, with your partner within your organization. Focus group discussions will be quite difficult um, through remote data collection methods um, because, uh, you know, it requires um, a, a facilitator that has a lot of experience in making sure that each of the per participants' voices are being heard. Um, just some of the more unique maybe methods out there are the participatory video or photo. So that would mean, you know, um, you would still need a facilitator or to, to sort of coach communities on how that they could, could do this. But, you know, now we have um, not everybody, but, um, you know, there are many that will have access to um, smartphones and would be able to take photos and document um, their daily lives and be able to, to tell stories about that. And that's a, a unique sort of method that can be leveraged um, if appropriate. Um, and also with crowdsourcing, this is a way to engage citizens as active contributors of data. So for example, in um, a program where they were mapping uh, where violent, violent um, occurrences were in a city, then you can see where um, to target the, the different services around um, preventing violence from happening. So the, the tool has um, many of the, the more details and will, will lead you to the different sources that you can look into to more detail. I did just want to, um, you know, raise, though, the issue around the digital gender divide. So, um, Dr. Frumzile Mbambo Guka, sorry, is um, the executive director of UN Women, 
she um, has published an op-ed where she's talking about the digital gender divide. And it's really key for us to consider in how we're approaching um, our work these days in terms of really reaching those the most vulnerable. Um, 433 million women are unconnected. 165 million fewer women than men own a mobile phone. And 1.7 billion people are excluded from the digital economy. That means that uh, and over half of those are women. And the digital economy is key right now, given that uh, many governments are you know, transferring cash for immediate assistance. And that means that there are a huge group of, of women and people that are excluded from, from those. So then what can we do, right? Let's discuss. <laughs> so we have some ethical guidelines. These are just, you know, to remind you that these are critical. Also, um, there are sort of different ethical guidelines that we need to consider when um, doing, you know, leveraging um, online platforms or um, big data. It's really important that uh, we ensure the do no harm principle and we provide information on support services and we always have our ethics and safety protocols in place. Um, you know, it's also important to consider, as mentioned, that we're all under stress, added stress. And so, you know, we need to take into consideration that people are just feeling really uncertain right now. And maybe it's not the appropriate time to, to um, engage in, in data collection. So some tips for engaging women in vulnerable groups. Um, I think first and foremost, it's really key that we're leveraging existing organizations and partnerships and networks. So when we, so realizing that there is this digital gen, you know, um, divide of, of women accessing mobile and internet, how can we reach them then? We can, reach out to women's networks. We can reach out to grassroots organizations who have a firsthand uh, links within the communities. So we can hear from them about the direct experience. We don't necessarily have to go straight to the people. Of course, that's ideal, but we also need to um, be cognizant that it may not be possible during uh, this situation but we should really look to those grassroots organizations and how can we support them to, to collect that data from their own constituents. Right now, everyone's uh, feeling the pressure of, of you know, um, funding dropping, et cetera. And so how can we really um, leverage those partnerships and support uh, grassroots organizations? Understanding the environment, doing a rapid assessment of women's uh, cell phone internet use, um, this information I mentioned around the digital you know, divide is um, there's a great report by GSMA. So a lot of this information is publicly available. You can look it up and even get very detailed information on, on the specific um, country or community that you're working in. Uh, using a recognized phone number is really important so that if people you know, are picking up the phone, they feel comfortable that they know who's, who's contacting them, using a female surveyor, um, using, being strategic with timing. Uh, we, need, we know that um, there are certain times of the day when it's just not good, when their care duties are heavy, um, or they may um, feel uncomfortable if their partner is home. Using the right language, of course, we need to ensure the primary language um, but also dialects um, are used and also um, avoid using stigmatizing language any, in any sort of materials that are um, distributed. And of utmost importance is really also considering the power dynamics that may be at play. When we get to the um, next phase, we'll be analyzing our data from a gender perspective. So we need to ensure that that plan is in place from the very beginning. Uh, there are different uh, anal analysis frameworks available. I will show you two of my favorite in the next slide. But um, just know that there are many out there. The important 
part is that, of course, we're always disaggregating data by sex and age um, in order to really understand the inequalities being experienced, we need to look across different dimensions of discrimination. We need to look at how um, different ethnic groups are being affected, how um, sexual orientation may um, affect people differently. And within this context, we know that there is um, compounded discrimination and compounded um, inequities. And that right now, this sort of pandemic is being amplifying the existing inequalities that exist. So it's really important to not just, I mean, of course, we should look at gender, but we also need to look across di different um, aspects. So, for example, disability status. Um, and then using a gender analysis framework. We also need to validate data. That's a really important step for us is to validate data with um, our key stakeholders to ensure that we're not uh, misinterpreting information. So as mentioned, these are two of my favorites, <laughs> the gender at work um, framework. So this is really looking at how the individual versus systemic uh, change is necessary and how there's formal and informal um, aspects of our lives that influence. Uh, the extent to which we can achieve transformative change. So these are different ways that you can organize the data to see to what extent are the programs really touching upon these different areas to be gender transformative. The gender results effectiveness scale was developed by a UNDP evaluation team and um, actually they will be presenting it is it tomorrow, Thursday this week? So I will share the information with you um, in another webinar that you can connect to. This uh, scale is really um, powerful when looking at the results that are um, reported. So from looking from gender, whether it's gender negative to gender transformative, um, gender blind, you know, are, are, is, is gender even uh, considered? is gender negative is whether it's actually having a deleterious effect. Is it, is it actually um, making um, inequalities worse? Um, and gender targeted, it means that we're just saying, okay, we want to have X number of women and X number of men participate. Whereas gender responsive is saying, we, we want to have participation, but we want to have meaningful participation. And gender transformative is taking that to the next level and saying that we need to have changes in our, in our systems at the systemic level, the structures, and um, this whole, so, so looking at the gender at work, um, whole of society approach to, to really affecting um, change to, to, to achieve gender equality. So I encourage you to seek out these resources and, and learn more. I think we could do a whole workshop on, on just these analysis frameworks. So I've already spoken way too much and I just wanted to um, also highlight these resources. So um, please visit our website. The pocket tool is available um, where you have many more details. Um, also, as I mentioned, the data.unwoman.org as COVID-19 emerging gender data and why it matters. And um, also this um, brief uh, on UN Women Brief on Violence Against Women and Girls data collection during COVID-19, which is really important for all of us to consider. And I think um, I really look forward to hearing from all of you uh, around your experiences and, and already um, conducting evaluations during this period. I just wanted to end with um, this quote from, from the same you know, op-ed from Dr. Fumzile. She says, COVID-19 has been the most disruptive global force in a generation, and where there is disruption, there is the potential to rebuild, reimagine, and create a radically better world. And that's what we really see gender responsive evaluation as providing us um, a, a means for doing. We want to use this as a tool for identifying the gaps and making those recommendations that can really try and um, make this sort of transformative change that we all want to see.
So thank you for that. Look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Thank you very much for a very insightful, your thoughts and presenting uh, various aspects of, uh, you know, uh, undertaking gender responsive evaluations, particularly in the situations like today, which we are facing. And I think you have uh, very nicely talked about uh, different phases, planning, preparedness, conduct, and also uh, the, the, the very powerful uh, analysis framework which you have presented uh, on which we can assess, you know, the gender results effectiveness on a, on a scale. And I think uh, uh, this has actually triggered minds uh, and questions among our participants as I can see many people have started putting uh, even questioning on the scale, uh, how could it be arranged and all those things. Well, uh, we will come back uh, on uh, those aspects in our next session when we open it up. Uh, before I uh, invite uh, the second uh, speaker, uh, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, talk about a little bit what is happening. And I think Sabrina was also talking about, you know, remote data collections and, and what are the, the issues related to that. Uh, you know, as uh, I think many of you and uh, even in other uh, sites of the research, uh, many of uh, people have started conducting and assessing the situation using remote data collection, using digital uh, platforms like internet and uh, mobile phone and all. And uh, even before COVID situation, I had come across, you know, a lot of scientific literature uh, published by SAGE and others. They talk about internet mediated research, which is a new upcoming field. Uh, given uh, given the, the the expansion of digital technology, big data, and all, but, uh, but those scientific literature actually talks about you know various aspects to be taken care of uh, to make the the method more robust uh, in situations like COVID. And let me take one example of uh, gender-based violence, and I think uh, participants have also put some questions on that is that how do we, uh, do we actually try to assess? Everyone says that due to lockdown, uh, the possibility is that, and even newspaper reporting that gender-based violence has actually increased, uh, but how do we provide an evidence to that? Uh, but it is also very, very difficult to, to actually ask these kind of you know, very sensitive questions on the experiences because of uh, the issues surrounding ethical privacy and so many aspects will, which I think you all know very well. So what we did is in one of the, the survey which we are doing coordinating with, uh, with our UN colleagues in India, we had asked a proxy questions and uh, the given is that uh, uh, we were not asking any household members, but we are using community volunteers as uh, uh, as the those who can inform us about uh, what is happening uh, in their communities. And we just added one or two questions and it is there on your screen. So uh, we just ask, have you heard or seen cases of violence against women and girls in your community? So it is just uh, talking about whether it is happening so that we, we understand uh, out of our surveyed community, not the household how many are actually uh, facing or they have heard about it. That phenomena is happening. So that's one part. And if that phenomena is happening, so what is their perception, the volunteers' uh, perception about whether it has increased as compared to the normal period or what kind of you know, their perceptions. I understand fully there are many ifs and buts between this question, but given uh, the, the kind of modality of uh, you know, getting data either through SMS or WhatsApp or uh, kind of you know, uh, Google Forms, so we have to compromise on that. Uh, given that uh, situation, we are also engaging with uh, many experts uh, to have a dialogue uh, on, on most of the aspects of technical aspects of uh, conducting remote data collection or even evaluation methodologies, including, uh, you know, the representativeness, biasness, and, and so many other aspects. How do we actually deal? And then while we discuss, we learn uh, that will be actually one of the good uh, uh, piece of work uh, which we can all share with uh, and, and we co-create and then we understand the solutions how to go about it uh, while keeping all the the fundamentals which Sabrina was 
uh, talking about. So with these uh, points, uh, now I move towards the next speaker, uh, Ritu Nanda. She is also uh, one of the core member of EcoI and uh, she is a uh, specialist and uh, particularly her research is in community-led action research. So uh, it's time to listen to, to Ritu. So Ritu, uh, over to you. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sanjay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm joining from Delhi. Uh, I see this session as a conversation and sharing of experiences because no one has all the answers. I definitely don't. So please share your experiences in the chat box so that we can co-create knowledge. Uh, but what do I bring today? Um, I've been part of two studies on COVID-19, one on informal uh, women workers and another which is ongoing, a big study on like what are the effects of COVID-19 on bonded labor, child labor and trafficking. In all, I have personally done 23 uh, interviews over the phone and I will share my learning and hope that you will also share. Uh, one um, learning I realized is the language. So the second study I did had three different languages in the community and I knew only one language. So which meant that I had to rely on others because if I tried a conference call with a translator, it would have taken a lot of time and, I, and this time of crisis taking time of communities is not correct. So uh, what I did was I trained um, uh, NGO staff and they conducted some interviews. But uh, what I additionally did was, uh, I was also constantly analyzing what was emerging, analyzing the data with the NGO staff, like asking questions like um, who was most affected, uh, which uh, population group has been denied of services and so on. And we got some very, um, uh, some answers like during the lockdown women have to walk miles to take a sick child to the health center uh, another thing i realized was this ethics i mean um, it's even more uh, we have to be more careful uh, like i had to rely on verbal consent and uh, the kind of mental um, stress the kind of mentality of uh, especially the communities and getting that validity of that consent in these unusual circumstances also can be questioned so to be very careful on that um, then is that i interviewed both community members especially women and also the organizational staff and i and i found that talking to the staff was relatively easier because they were relaxed had time but like the women participants they seemed mentally stressed um, they seem their attention seem to be elsewhere. Many of them have lost their income. Care responsibilities have increased because children and family are at home. So, you know, there was this interview where the participant was trying to pacify her son. She was talking to me. And there was a dilemma in my mind as an evaluator. We need to collect data, but, but we are approaching these respondents who are disturbed, struggling to survive in uh, trying circumstances. Uh, another learning I had is perfectionism, not possible. Sampling cannot be strictly followed. As most marginalized population, many of them, like for example, those working in tea gardens, don't have phones. Some phones are no longer functional. Some have not recharged their phones because they don't have money to charge the phone. And those who have charged their phone, the phones of the wives or the adolescent girls have not been charged. Like what is the need of recharging uh, women and girls' phones when they are sitting at home? That's what the thinking is in the community. And in many cases, I had to talk to the male adult in the house. You know, he would give, um, first I would have to convince him, then talk to the female respondent. Um, and then uh, I had to be very careful also about keeping uh, women on the phone for long because I was worried that she might be subject to domestic violence because she was talking to me for a long time. Uh, I had to, in two interviews, I had to cut short some interviews because the battery had died. And uh, I did go back um, to uh, complete the interview, but it was a tough task. You know, just fixing the interviews was very hard. Um, what, uh, what helped? Uh, that's the question. It was like uh, deep listening and empathy and relating as a human being because there are no visual clues there. 
So just the sound. So the audio also, you have to be like very alert and deeply listen. What is the person saying? But making that person comfortable. It's a conversation. It can't be a question and answer. That's extremely important. Um, and also yourself as an evaluation professional. Remember that whatever you're getting is good enough. Like uh, getting fixated on rigor of methods uh, uh, can be hard this time gather enough information so that which can help you to make decisions it's okay if the interview is not finished um then is that hardships as they say never come alone they come in battalions so when i was conducting this study the state of west bengal has been hit by a massive cyclone then in another uh, ngo the we've lost one staff to covid 19 so so I've had to stall uh, the, uh, the data collection in these cases. And it'll be, so it's got delayed. It may not happen at the time you want. Um, so I also have been reflecting with uh, my teammates on like what could we have done better or um, so because these uh, non-availability of phones in the communities, especially the most marginalized, has program repercussions because we are at this moment the implementation team is trying to reach these women and girls but they don't have phones they cannot uh, report of any abuse to helplines even most of the child marriage cases have been reported by others and not those affected uh, so and some people during the interview said that they don't have smartphones so they have been deprived of messages of relief so as sabrina also said that being offline leads to social exclusion and hinders access to public services so what we could have done before then or what should what steps we take when hopefully the lockdown lockdown is over is uh, during community visits we insist that especially those who are most vulnerable women adolescent girls differently able if we have their details and uh, and they are registered on the helpline so at least the helpline staff can check back are you okay um, and of course, we as organizations also need to start thinking on how to get digital inclusion, uh, serious thinking on that. Um, and now I, I also have some questions. As I said, I don't have all the answers. All the questions you're raising, I don't have because I am struggling. I facilitate participatory action research, participatory evaluation. So how am I going to uh, get communities to take part, to part in this when we are not even able to get most marginalized on the phone? We are talking to community leaders. We, we want to talk to those who are really affected. Um, and uh, what I'm also like thinking that in this case of physical distancing, how do we conduct the FGDs? Um, and uh, because the, the, the communities are also wary of staff coming to their areas because of the fear of COVID-19. So uh, there is a great risk that valuable participatory processes will be dismissed. Uh, we have seen this happen during uh, Ebola epidemic in Africa. And if we fail to listen to the voices of women collectives, differently abled, um, it can affect our policies, it can affect our uh, um, our program implementation. Um, so uh, our team, what did we think? We thought that when it will be possible, we are going to get communities ready for pandemic, for collecting data, so, so that we are all partners. Because uh, as we talk about gender transformative evaluations, we realize it's not a linear process. It's um, uh, when we work with communities, especially when we're examining power relations, there's a backlash. So we take two steps forward and then you take five steps, uh, steps backward. So, and in this case of COVID-19, I don't know how back we have gone. So um, let's seriously think together what is the way and not leave in this dialogue. Let us not overlook the most marginalized. How can they take ownership? And I hope to hear from you, your experiences and not just challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ritu, for providing um, uh, your experiences, uh, particularly from your interviews during COVID time, which you faced, and your personal experiences, which can be a very, very rich source of information, and uh, uh, we should be prepared for that. Uh, so, friends, um, with these uh, 
uh, two presentations. Now we are going to open up uh, with the questions and answer session. And I think you can raise hands uh, in, the, in, the, in the box there so we can invite uh, to you to also to speak and share. But uh, before uh, I do that, I just want to ask a point is that uh, after listening to the real life, uh, life examples of evaluations and interviews, I think um, uh, use of quantitative or qualitative method while doing this gender responsive evaluation will have a different uh, implications. How do you plan? How do you conduct the evaluation? So please keep that uh, in mind uh, while, while you start designing on that. Uh, so with this, let me um, uh, uh, start um, uh, the, the question answer session and I think I have one uh, hand raised since long uh, by Gopi. So Gopi if you want to come and, and talk about but please be uh, brief and to the point. So thank you very much. Yeah, can, can we listen from you, Gopi, or uh, we move to the, the question answers? We are not able to listen to you. Okay, by the time you prepare yourself, so let's uh, let's go back to, to the question answer sessions. And I think uh, there are very pertinent uh, questions uh, posed there. And uh, one of them has already been answered by uh, Sabrina. Uh, this is, uh, what is the recommended remote data collections uh, when internet is an issue? And she has very nicely talked about uh, uh, what are the grassroots organizations use of volunteers because uh, rapo buildings and so many important things are all very very important so she has given thoughts on that uh, so may i invite um, uh, sabrina to to take up some of the questions which is there uh, in in the in the question answer box yes hi um well, I think uh, we're all, you know, wondering around um, the digital divide and how to really, um, ac you know, access the populations that need to be heard from the most, those that are uh, the most marginalized in this uh, situation. Um, and I think what we can do now is uh, do a thorough, you know, mapping of the organizations that exist we can identify, um, even at a grassroots level, the sort of community leaders that are um, that we could engage and, and speak to to understand the different perspectives. Um, I'm not saying just one. I mean, we'd have to engage multiple perspectives because we know that um, we need to sort of triangulate and understand, um, and then we can also as mentioned, um, seek, you know, sort of administrative data. So um, from service centers, uh, health, health service providers, um, around the number, you know, the, the people that are coming there and how they're accessing those populations. Um, I, I would just stress right now, those grassroots organizations are really key and we need to find ways collectively of supporting them, of providing them with funds to keep operating um, and to, to provide them with um, a life, lifeline support so that they can also um, ensure and support their constituents. Um, it could also be reaching out to religious uh, leaders uh, that, that have um, particular clout within communities to understand their perspectives. So these are just some ideas, but I'd love to hear from others. And I know that Nidhi <laughs> has um, raised some questions. So... Maybe, maybe if you'd like to speak here, I can um, allow you to talk and unmute yourself <laughs> if you'd like to. You can speak now, unmute. Maybe. Hello. Hi. Yes. Would you like to raise any issues or share share some experience from your end? Uh, yeah. Um, no, actually speaking about the digital divide, I think that um, I accept your uh, you know, ex explanation that this is the reason why we need to have a community footprint uh, at the grassroots level and the way that 
organizations or uh, researchers, we, we approach how we go about, um, you know, harvesting this, this local knowledge and experiences. But I think that um, given the, the pandemic and we are in really such a, a unique situation where even the community leaders or religious leaders that are in the community, even they may not have, uh, you know, access to, um, you know, information that's, you know, regarding sensitive issues such as violence against women. So I think this is something that I think we should all recognize that these months, what we're dealing with, you know, is, is a situation which is extremely precarious, it's unprecedented. And even the fact that uh, we may have grassroots um, actors who can provide us with information, they are also, uh, you know, uh, surviving in, in extreme, with extreme constraints. So I think this is just one of those things that we have to understand that then in future, perhaps look at, you know, um, provision of technology or, uh, you know, uh, other, other, other ways where we can kind of look back in hindsight and perhaps, you know, look at phone records of NGOs or police records and, you know, in, in hindsight, uh, do kind of like a retroactive uh, research and, and, and then reach out to those people when the lockdown is over. Yes, thank you for that intervention, Ibi. Um, I see another um, a question from Merwin Sal Salazar. Uh, around in, ensuring a gender lens is embedded in the key evaluation questions. So I think, you know, this is um, key to, to considering. So oftentimes the evaluation questions themselves do not have that lens already integrated. So how can we, you know, do that in a concrete way? I think it really depends on what you're looking at. But what I can say is, you know, for example, some of the key issues that I see, even within my own organization, is that we're often um, like bean counting. We're looking at the activity level, not, you know, and we're not looking beyond. And so that means, you know, not just seeing who's participating, but to what extent are they participating? To what extent do people feel empowered in uh, decision making processes? To what extent are women at the table is important, but the extent to which they have the skills and knowledge to be able to have meaningful participation will ensure that they're raising the issues that need to be raised to, to um, have a truly gender transformative approach to really change the power dynamics that are at play. So we can ask questions around, you know, the extent to which people are empowered or feel empowered. We can look at decision-making processes and understand um, how, how women are influencing those decision-making processes. We can look at access to resources and not only are, uh, has, maybe has income increased, but to what extent are women able to make decisions around how those resources are used? Um, it really depends on what we're looking at, but it's about digging deeper into the issues. Um, Sanjay or Ritu, you have anything to add there? Uh, no, I think you have uh, you have answered the question. I hope uh, uh, the participants would have got the answers. But uh, I was also looking on the, the the questions. There are many open questions. Um, uh, how do we do assessment in slum areas of Bangladesh? And uh, so these are the very micro things. You know, we uh, I think uh, uh, more importantly here, what has been discussed about the conceptualizations, key questions of of your evaluation. But how do you actually collect the data? Uh, that is uh, very much uh, rests with the local context and conditions and what are the things allowed. If I just go back to Sabrina's point is that do no harm. I mean, everyone should be protected, safe. And um, also that any of our action or data collection should not lead to any untoward incidents, even in the community. 
particularly asking about sensitive question on gender. So those aspects actually we have to, uh, to, to, the, to take into considerations. And I don't think that there are uh, very ready-made answers to, to these questions. How do we do? It all depends uh, how it's on your, uh, you know, how do you handle given the local context. Um, uh, one question was also there for about uh, use of third party monitoring. Uh, so I think, uh, I think Sabrina, if you, if you want to can add to that, but it's again, uh, the same question comes in whether uh, you as an organization do it or you engage any third party. So all principles and all consideration has to be, you know, kept in mind. By, it's, it's only the difference between the modalities, whether you are doing directly or you are hiring some, uh, some organization to do third party uh, monitoring. Um, some questions was there uh, on your pocket tool, uh, uh, anything on the readiness for evaluation in this situation. So Sabrina, if you want to reflect on that, then we can move to quickly to the other questions because we also are running uh, short of a time because we are over uh, one hour. Yeah, I think, um, no, I don't see that specific one, but um, I encourage you, yeah, to, oh, in the, on the readiness for evaluations. Yes, there is, um, we don't have really a threshold and it will really just depend on your organization, but we need to understand, you know, um, what types of information you will be able to collect. It really depends on the, the context, the COVID-19, you know, status, uh, the status of the pandemic in uh, your country and the guidance from local health authorities. So we'll really have to uh, make decisions, you know, kind of on a case by case basis. Um, we do have some questions for you. So we hope that you can go back to Menti. I will share my, <laughs> my screen again. Yeah, sure. um, yeah. Okay, so um, colleagues, please go to Menti. Dot com and use the code 117378. So here's your chance. It's a little quiz. Please join. <laughs> okay, we have some people joining. So you have to answer fast. We should always ask individuals whether they have directly experienced violence during an assessment or evaluation. Were you listening today? <laughs> Is this true or false? Good job. So. We know that we should not directly ask about violence during assessments. We should, there are indirect ways of asking about violence within a community. Um, and I encourage you to look up um, recommendations. There's an entire brief from you and women on the, on collecting um, data on violence against women and girls. And so we really need to ensure that we are um, following this guidance and not um, exacerbating uh, a, a, a bad situation. So please, um, I, we shared the link in the chat. So please look at that again. I think we go to the next question. Evaluation teams should always have information on GBV and COVID-19 resources available in the community. True or false? Great job. So yes, we do encourage you to always have information available because even if you're not directly asking these questions, it may still come up and we should always have resources available um, on and information on how to access resources. So 
so oh here's the ranking <laughs> whoever wolfmeister is you did a great job <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is for fun. Let's see, can we go to the next question? We have a few more questions. Sorry, I just need to figure out how to do it. <laughs> Okay, so this one, what innovative methods have you employed in your evaluation during COVID-19? So this is um, what Ritu was asking. If you could share with us, then we have, we can document this and share with everyone any sort of innovative methods that you have employed. So please go to the menti.com and use the code. Have one. Maybe people are finished with their coffee <laughs> break. Oh, here we go. Social media, mobile-based survey, phone, using the phone, having deeper empathy, shorter, clear questions, really important using social media hashtags. We're really reliant on the phone right now. Looking at online likes. Great, thank you for sharing. So what are your three takeaways from today? We really appreciate your participation and we'd like to hear from you what kind of has stuck with you and how will you take this information and actually use it? Oh, do no harm, visual aids. You have a toolkit you can look into for more resources. The importance of listening, social factors, using indirect methods, secondary sources, power dynamics in society, considering at risk people, keeping gender central, and do no harm as the main. <laughs> Take away, great. Well, you can keep entering and um, we will, I will hand it over to our colleague who will be giving closing remarks. Thank you, Sabrina, thank you. Uh, and it was really uh, uh, nice to listen back from the participants about their takeaways and their answers. So uh, friends, we are towards the end of this uh, uh, the sessions and uh, let me invite uh, uh, Emil Ipa, who is uh, currently Secretary of the Sri Lankan uh, Evaluation Associations to give the, the closing remark. So over to you, Ipa. Yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Kumar. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. On behalf of Sri Lanka Evaluation Association, ISTA Pacific Evaluation Association and the other partners, I would like to express my gratitude to Ms. Sabrina Evangelista, Monitoring and Evaluation Specialist, UN Women Asia Pacific, for accepting our invitation and conducting an excellent presentation on what steps can we take to ensure gender-responsive evaluation during COVID-19 pandemic. 
I would also like to thank um, the moderator, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, co group member, Evolution Community of India, co group member, Evolution Community of India, for taking part in this discussion. Uh, thank you, uh, Bachuka, for the welcome remarks. Last but not least, I thank each and every one of you for being here today and taking the time to listen to the presentation and the discussion. And we are also looking forward to your participation in upcoming webinars. With that, let me wish you all a great day ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Dr. Sanjay. Thank you, thank you, pa. thank you very much. And you have already put up uh, what are the upcoming things for which uh, uh, the uh, the calls will be uh, opening up and the times uh, participants can note. And uh, friends, uh, this has been recorded and uh, at any future times, we will be sharing uh, with you the link. And uh, once again, I thank all the speaker and all the participants who actually share their uh, rich experiences through chat box and ask those questions. So let me formally um, close this uh, while uh, once again, thanking you all for your precious time and, and contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you, take care. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Apia, and thank you, you and <laughs> Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it was great. Thank you very much.